Charlotte. Uh, thank you all. And um, I'd also like to say uh, what an absolute thrill it is for the first time uh, for me to be standing on the land of the Nyabali peoples. And I pay my respects to them and to also the custodians of the land, the Maru. And if I were stood at home on Coolin land in, Western, in um, Melbourne, I would say woman jika, which means welcome. Uh, when I was in Perth and on Noongar land, I would have said kaya, but in Mardu, apparently I should say your wanjalba. So your wanjalba. I was asked to do two things. Uh, first of all, give a provocation. Secondly, give an inspiration uh, in these 30 minutes. Uh, I'm very aware that when you say the word provocation uh, in Western Australia, people get, oh, hello. They think there's going to be a bit of a scrap. So there might be. We'll see. Um, certainly yesterday, Brian got very excited about that. Uh, so if you see Brian Robinson running at the stage, uh, I don't know which side you'll jump on, but I'm guessing. Um, it's also wonderful to be here at an incredible moment of opportunity. There are certain moments in life and in careers and in the world where you think, this is a moment when everything is to play for, when everything is possible. And I shouldn't have got involved in that. I got involved in the microphone. School by error. Um, what I realized standing here in this unbelievably beautiful and actually fundamentally practical art center, we walked in yesterday. Um, and actually, I was with Brian. And Brian just, just said, I'm not leaving here. This is where I want to make work. And if you're creating a space, that's what you want artists to say. You want artists to walk onto your land, into your buildings, and say, I don't want to leave. And the fact that this building is two years old, that Jennifer and Trent worked so closely with the Maru people to make something which was, from what I understand, three times the size that the original plans were, that it was meant to be smaller, and I'm sure it was delivered on exactly the same budget. I don't know, I wasn't there. Uh, people will know, but the fact that this space is so epic and so beautiful and at the center of this gorgeous land is really fantastically important. Otherwise, you risk having an art center that's dwarfed by the truck uh, that is 20 meters from where I'm staying. And the, the truck that's 20 meters from where I'm staying is larger than the first arts organization I worked in. I mean, it's physically larger than the building I was in. And this is a land of giants. It's a land of unbelievable space and beauty and possibility. And so the fact that this venue totally reflects that is fabulous. Um, in my experience, four things can limit the scale of an idea uh, or the scale of a possibility. And those four things are world-class talent. You have to have that, otherwise um, it's difficult. You can be limited by imagination and ambition. You can be limited by the resources and the space you're working with, and you can be limited by the permissions and what you're allowed to do. But truth be told, there's a fifth. Um, and I only realized it yesterday, truthfully, which is ego. Uh, as an artist, as a writer, as a presenter, as an architect, as anybody at all, the moment you let your ego get between you and what you should be doing, you have a problem. So to co-create a space like this with the Madhu people, that's why it works. That's why it's beautiful. And I think that's a really great place to start for the next two days of conversation. I also think um, the idea of collaboration is because, um, obviously, I'm an artistic director, so I, I, I use very high, highfalutin um, uh, met, uh, references. But uh, the, the Pixar film Ratatouille, uh, in the words of Ratatouille, I'm not saying that anyone can have a great idea, but a great idea can come from anywhere and from anyone. And so the realization that what might seem like an idea from someone who maybe hasn't seen every building in the world, the essence of saying we need to be on land and painting on land and we need there to be unbroken ground between us and the rest of this country in order to be creative, that's an unbelievable brief. And that's also an unbelievable idea which we see made real. We also realize that, um, that there's a palpable energy here. And it comes from the fact that some of the people in this room are recognized around the world. And yet, to us, we just see them as one of our brothers, one of our sisters, one of our friends. And 
I want to mention why the arts and why culture are important, because I know, and I say it all the time, and I feel like it's a cliche, but I also hear people regularly say, I don't really like the arts, I'm into sport, or I don't like the arts, it's not my thing. And in each case, I, I think, and occasionally I say, uh, do you watch movies on a plane? Do you watch HBO? Do you listen to music? Do you like computer games? Do you, do you literally pick up your phone and play a computer game? If you like any of those things, you like the arts, you like culture, you like creativity. I do not believe there is a difference in the quality of art between Mahler and Macklemore or between Shakespeare and Aaron Sorkin. I, I fundamentally believe all these people are creating great art. And so we're here because what will last for decades and centuries will be the art that's created. And it's also fantastic to be here because there is an absolutely palpable energy in the room. The artists I've met so far have been amazing. The red dirt is uplifting. Uh, Brian is refusing to leave. Last night, Terry said his adrenaline is up, so game's on. And fundamentally, we're here, the right people in the room. And if you want any greater example of that, I'm going to point at Curtis, uh, our friend Curtis over here, who, to many of us uh, here, I'm sure we know Curtis as a filmmaker and artist who probably asks for money to do stuff and has ideas and wants to do things. In the rest of the world, at Davos, for example, Curtis is known as part of the team that made the film that actually fundamentally changed the global policy on nuclear proliferation uh, with Lynette Walworth. So that's the talent we have in this room, and it's everywhere, and we all need to remember that and embrace that. I'm now going to say a few things about why I'm here. Uh, because at this moment, people are confused. Uh, there's an accent thing going on. Um, there's a, yeah, that's right. Is, 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 he, is he an artistic director or just English? So a few words about how I came to be here uh, this morning. Starting with a picture, obviously, of me as a baby, just in case uh, you weren't sure whether, I mean, you might be a bit of a wanker. Picture of me as a baby. Nailed it. Um, <laughs> So I was born in Sheffield, uh, which is a uh, steel town and steel land and uh, a mining uh, area of the world, or was. And um, in the 70s, my nana was a little mester, which means she put the marks on knives. If anyone has a yellow-bladed butter knife, uh, the flat-bladed knives with a yellow handle, um, and it says, if it says on it made in Sheffield, there are three ways that can happen. It can happen with a stamp, it can happen with a laser, but over a million of them, and almost everyone I know has one, is acid etched. And my nana put those marks on. She put the marks on every single one. She went in and she did hundreds every day for her whole life. And I show that picture because from her, I reckon I learned storytelling. I learned just keep going because actually the world is changed by everyday heroes, not the people who did the thing that means they stand in front of a microphone. Although the most scary place to ever get was between her and a radio presenter. She loved that storytelling. Um, but it's just the fact that that edge and that sharpness and the importance of a single job done over and over again. Um, that, and my father is the one on your right. Uh, he was a journalist. Oh, the, that picture's mainly there to laugh at the moustache of the guy on the left, though. I'm going to be honest, that's really bad. It was the 70s, and we thank them for that. Um, and my father was a journalist and music critic, so I was brought up around storytelling. Uh, that's me uh, in, the, in the middle of the picture. Uh, thank, thank you to the uh, late 80s, early 90s, and that faux aviator jacket. Um, and I went into theatre because I looked like that, so it was the law. And I directed theatre and ended up in London at the Royal National Theatre, which um, looked like that when I arrived. And my job was to make it look like that. It was to take a building that people didn't necessarily love. Um, there was a fine line between the National Theatre and a car park in many people's minds. Uh, I think Prince Charles said the, his favorite place in London was the, was the, um, the terrace of the National Theatre because it was the only place in London from which you couldn't see the National Theatre. Um, and I went there to transform the way people engaged with culture, with a building, and with ideas. During that time, I fell in love with festivals. And that came about because of the realization festivals give you license to do 
what is otherwise not doable. This is uh, a picture from a festival in South America. For thousands of years, people have always said, the show will start at 7.30, we'll meet on the slopey bit next to the flat bit. That's how performance happened. And then we suddenly get festivals. This is a festival where when there is a show, they lay out lanterns so everyone in the town knows there's going to be a show. People go out there and they follow the lanterns to the center of the town. The lanterns end, they're in the main square, and they see the show. And I think that's absolutely beautiful. It's not dissimilar to what we did last night. Now I'm thinking about it. Um, it also does actually help if you know where the center of the town is. Otherwise, if you follow the lanterns the wrong way, you end up like in the countryside. But it's a beautiful idea. And then digital world happened and uh, mobile phones happened. And in, um, when that happened, uh, the editor of Harper's, Bill Wozniak, um, invented the, the, um, the crowd, uh, the, the, the flash mob. The idea of a, a crowd-sourced event, the flash mob. And he brought everyone together. This is a picture of a pillow fight in London where thousands of people have gathered with text messages, arrived, and they just do what they do. Now, he did that apparently not as an artistic experiment. He says he did it to find out how gullible hipsters are. And I think he's running a little cafe just next to where I live in Collingwood, which sells a flat white in an avocado shell. So he's absolutely right. Um, from that, we move into my time in festivals, which started in the UK, in Norwich. Uh, this was one of my first events uh, in which seven or eight French people hung off a crane and drummed. Now, I'm going to be honest, I don't, I don't think this reflects well on me, and it's a bad thing to say, but if you want to be really popular as a festival director in the UK, you say that your opening event is going to be hanging seven French people off a crane, but I, I'm... <laughs> I'm neither proud nor, nor happy about that, but it is true. And from there, um, and also this is a, another French performance event in which uh, everybody's uh, head was set fire to, uh, but with consent. Um, and then I ended up coming to Perth to run uh, the Perth International Arts Festival. And, um, and I had the absolute time of my life. I loved remote, edgy festivals that made an absolute difference. We opened with, um, on Cottesloe Beach with an event at dawn, that's Barry Maguire, uh, leading an event and the Nungar community welcoming people and singing a song. Um, from there, at the end of my first festival, as Charlotte said, we had what we affectionately known as the Feathers, Place des Anges, in which 30,000 people danced in the street um, under two tons of feathers. Now, if it's not a festival, you say to people, we'd like to drop two tons of feathers, and they go, there's actually no way on earth we're letting you do that. But when it's a festival, people say, sure. And the reason for that is you have license, number one. Number two, it'll be over soon. If you don't like it, it's 18 days. Um, obviously, th with this example, is awkward because there were feathers everywhere for the next four years. Uh, so uh, if there's any hoteliers, owners of... Um, lift shafts or pools, I, I, in Western Australia, I do apologize again. Um, and at the end of that, we had the question, what's next? And the answer to what's next was the question that we're asking ourselves now. You start with what story do we want to tell? We knew we wanted to tell the story of the Nungar nation. We wanted to tell the story of 100 years uh, since Anzac, we wanted to tell the story of Western Australia as an ambitious, brilliant, fabulous place that was the most beautiful place on earth. And we wanted to involve every single child in Western Australia if we possibly could. Which meant there was only one company that we could turn to who could do that, and that was Royal Deluxe. We did that. The problem we had was that they were already under offer to another city festival, which I won't name because that would be very rude. So they had an option and we couldn't do it. Um, I kept talking to them. A year later, Sydney Festival let that option drop. And, and we, uh, have the Sydney people got here yet? Are you, you've, okay, uh, that's awkward. Uh, so we, we, we said yes to the company, we're gonna try. And then we started the most epic journey of trying to persuade people. And in order to do it, the people we needed to persuade, quite simply, well, we needed to raise five and a half 
million dollars. Um, and we needed to have everyone supporting us, including the media, marketing, finance, our contract team, every element of politics, uh, a technical team that was uh, the size of an army, the actual army, navy, air force, ambulance service, transperth, police, fire, the city, main roads, air traffic control. To this day, I do not know why we needed air traffic control, but if they didn't sign it off, we couldn't do the gig. The Returned and Services League, uh, the elders of the Nangar Nation, our sponsors, stakeholders, and a French socialist anarchist alcoholic-led street theatre company uh, from, uh, the west of, uh, from the yeah, west of France uh, who, who were not easy to work with, some would say. So, uh, quick show of hands. Did, who here saw The Giants live? Oh, it's great. And did, uh, uh, for those who didn't and for those who did, and for those who worked on it, who are sat over there with post-traumatic stress disorder, here's a short video um, of actually what the whole thing was. More than half a million people have packed the city to watch the Giants. Sam, this is street art at its most creative. There was little space on the footpath. And it's the biggest event of its kind Perth has ever seen. While it stretched the transport network and pushed the city to its limits. Uh, there are people as far as the eye can see. Crowds never before seen in the city have gathered to get a glimpse. Perth's in the grip of giant fever tonight. A wonderful start to the Perth International Arts Festival. One thing is obvious, nothing has ever captured the imagination of Perth quite like these giants. So that's what ended up happening. Obviously, the journey there was slightly more complicated than that and complex. Um, and uh, I've got another two and a half hours that I can talk about that, uh, but not today. But what was interesting was about seeking permission and getting everyone's buy-in. Um, we started with a story and what we wanted to achieve. We told that story over and over and over again. Every single member of the team talked that story through over and over again. We kind of approached it with the idea that it was 50-50, whether we'd ever get there, but in the words of Gary Larson, if we pull this off, we'll eat like kings. Um, we knew that the, the potential gain was massive and that it would really make a difference and influence people. We also knew quite early on that it wasn't going to be, we weren't going to get a yes from anyone. What we got was a thousand not no's. So the police said, you know, it looks great, and, and, but we're in if the ambulance service are in. And the ambulance service said, well, look, it's not a problem for us, but you'll never get the fire brigade over the line. The fire brigade said, Transperth. Transperth said, Main Roads are never going to go for it. Main Roads uh, said, you're not going to persuade a Liberal uh, cabinet to give you the money. Um, uh, the Liberal cabinet uh, weren't in when we called, so we then went to, an, I mean, it went on and on, until eventually everybody had said it's not no. And everybody was prepared for it to just disappear. But they were also 
they'd also put themselves in the position where if everybody did say uh, yes, or somebody said yes, there was nothing we could do. And so having raised about $4 million, but being $1.5 million short, we were told that that was it, it was over, we should stop. So we, I, I wrote the letter uh, to say that in which we were announcing it would finish. Actually, what the letter said was, uh, despite the fact that this will reach over a million people, will raise about $40 million in economic impact for an additional $1.5 million investment, despite the fact that every child will understand all of these stories. Uh, uh, the whole world will see what we do. It'll bring pleasure and jobs and money, and also it'll stick it to every other uh, state in, in, in Australia. I, we didn't say that last one, obviously, but may have implied it. Um, despite all of that, unless something happens by next Tuesday that's miraculous, we'll have to tell the company it's off, which clearly isn't quite a it's off. Uh, and so by the next week, uh, we'd had the conversation, we managed to have the conversation with government, and we got the yes. And we were as surprised as anyone because internal um, opposition and tension is always as strong as external. Within an organization, get, getting everyone to believe in the same story is difficult. We got the yes on the 14th of July, 2014. We called the company, but it was Bastille Day, so they were all out having a party. So we called them the next day, and then we agreed to do the gig. Um, in doing it, it became a story of everyday heroes. This is one of my favorite pictures because it shows the crane that lifted the giant. Now, you can't lift a charged load over people in Australia according to the lifting and load loading regulations. It's just a fact. You can't do it. So at the moment when we have to lift this 70-ton giant over the top of an audience uh, and, and lower him on the other side of a bridge, we knew we had a problem. Our technical director, Drew Diamond, who now works in Albany, uh, who was an absolute genius on this project, had the realization that if we relabeled this and recategorized it as a fairground attraction instead of a lifted load off a crane, different rules applied. So he found the leading fairground attraction licensor in Australia said, what do we need to do? They said, you need a secondary and then another clip. I don't really know what they did. I'm saying that, I've no idea, but I'll make it up. They do this and do that. At that moment, live, that person signed a piece of paper recategorizing it as a fairground attraction. It went up over the audience, came back down. As it was unclipped, they re-signed it, and it became a crane holding a giant again. And it was that level of brilliance. Everyone says that the artists are the most creative people in the room, but it's a technical director who just thinks about it for long enough to say that is always a solution. Um, I'm going to skip that a video, although Viet's going to be devastated, but we'll watch it later. Um, this work did reach a lot of people, and uh, this, is, oh, this is actually the moment when I saw Jean-Luc, uh, the artistic director of, uh, of Royal Deluxe, and told him, uh, that was horrifying. Um, the work worked, and it, rose, it lifted the ambition, and it raised the game, and Leonard Bernstein, the composer, said, all you need to achieve something is a plan and not quite enough time. So that's how we approached it. One of the things I really want to talk about now, this morning, though, is, is why we're here, because that happened, and it was great, and everybody since has said the same thing as they said after the feathers, how do you follow that? And the answer is, absolutely, with ambition, with belief, with understanding, by having a conversation, and by using every single one of the people in the room. And all the people in this room are the right people to do absolutely anything that you want to do here in the Pilbara. It's amazing land, and it's an amazing group of people. And I want to talk a bit about how I believe ideas happen. After I've gone through these pictures. 400,000 people saw the final morning, which was um, an Anzac commemoration uh, with the eternal flame, uh, followed by a procession, and then the giants left. So this, let's get down to a rhombus. Um, ideas happen because at the first point, A, you start with an idea, and at the final point, Z, that idea is delivered. 
the middle point of any idea journey is M, which obviously stands for middle, but it's also the middle letter of the alphabet. Coincidence? I think so. The worst ideas, I believe, are ones that start with a single idea and go straight to the end. We're going to do a thing, we do a thing. No influence, no consultation, no discussion. The second worst ideas are ones that start with a single idea, take all the consultation, and then do something that's so big and ridiculous and wide that there's nothing more can be added to it. I believe the perfect idea starts with that thought, goes out to the point where there's so much influence, and then comes back in again to a point where you say, what is this all about? And the four stages of those ideas you start with creation. What is the idea? What are we going to do? Giant thinking is the really important next stage. It's the idea that says, what's the biggest it can be? Just keep going, keep thinking, keep being influenced. Consult absolutely everybody, but know the moment when you change, because there are only two stages of any artistic project. It's too soon to tell, and it's too late to do anything about it. And the point of the board, the point of, uh, of funders, the point of a team is at the moment of change to say, are we doing this thing? So the next stage is about editing down, pulling back direction and creating what is this thing going to end up being with the final point of delivery. Truth be told, before that is fertility. It's when the land is fertile. It's when we're saying when you're putting things off and not knowing where you're going. And after that, there is celebration, reflection, and acquittal, as uh, Rania pointed out to me yesterday. I hadn't used the word acquittal in my presentation. Never do, but I should. Acquittal. Uh, but also mourning that it's gone, that you've done it, that you've achieved something. And so over the next two days, our question needs to be, what are the ideas that will resonate here? What will we follow? And then what are the questions you ask at each point of this process? The first question is, what is it all for? Why are we even here? Why are we having this conversation? The second question, as you're about to engage in a new idea, is, is this it? And every artist will know that. Artists have many, many, many ideas. And that moment of going, is this the one I want to dedicate the next hour, year, decade, lifetime to? At the point of creation to giant thinking, what could this be? How can we make this bigger than you can ever imagine? Every one of us has seen um, small, exquisite, beautiful works of art made by uh, people from this country. But to see a six by three on a wall in which a building seems to have been created around it, that's thrilling. So what could it be? And then at the moment when you've got everything it could be, what actually should it be? What should we lose? What is it not? To that key point of too soon to tell, too late to do anything, are we doing this? Uh, is this the one? And then you're off, no choice. This is it. And you deliver the idea. And finally, at the very end of it all, what was it all for? Which exactly links back to what is it all for? And so that, in my view, is how I've approached everything I've ever done, but also every artist I see. And the fertility part, is your whole life. That's everything that brought you to that moment. The, the Picasso um, story about, um, about drawing on a napkin and someone saying, can I buy that? And, and Picasso saying, uh, yes, it's 100,000 pounds. And the person saying, it took you a minute. And he said, no, it took me a lifetime. Um, although actually now, since Nanette and Hannah Gadsby, I really wish I hadn't used Picasso as an example. Woody Allen, no, nope, still no. Nope. Um, this is a land of giants. The Western Australia was always described as a land of giants. It's a land where the landscape is so huge and the ideas are so big and the space is so beautiful. And just simply the idea of the story of how water came into the rest of Western Australia is a really interesting one. But so is the way the land has been used for tens and tens of thousands of years. So over the next 
two days, I would love us to have that conversation about why are we here? What's it all for? How can we be prepared for the next opportunity? How can we be prepared for the moment when an Anthony Gormley says, I'd like to put 51, apparently now 49, sculptures uh, into a space just next to Menzies? How do we create a space in which the next Wave Rock weekender, which is this weekend in fact, happens here? How can we be the place where when someone says I'd like to run the Burning Man Festival, as they do in the desert in Nevada, this is the space it happens. How can we be the place that is prepared when someone says, I want to build a massive sculpture right next to the road, and one guy working for the council had prepared that land, he knew the space, he knew the, uh, what the air traffic control was, he knew the weight loading, and so when they said, can we do this thing, he was absolutely ready to do it, and simply said yes. Because when the idea comes, you have very little time. You have to say yes quickly. This, these two days, this weekend, is the time to find out what those ideas are and to share all of our thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. We're going to get Jonathan to stay where he is. You prepared to take some questions without notice here today? Fun. Yes. Are there any questions from the audience for Jonathan? Because it's a bit of a rare opportunity to pick the brain of someone who's got decades of experience in public art and festivals and culture. So if there are any questions from the audience, we are all ears. I mean, it's rare and uh, you've got until tomorrow afternoon, obviously it's not so rare, but it would, I'm this more than it. happy to. I'm also happy to be completely scurrilous about Western Australia or the East Coast, anywhere else. I had a bit of a question, if I can kick things off. We're going to talk later today about distinctiveness, yep. particularly in Perth, and I grew up in the country, I think in regional towns as well. We do a lot of talk around um, how can we be more like Melbourne, or if you're in Melbourne, how can we be more like New York in terms of our cultural offering? Do you think here in WA, and particularly in regional WA, we are embracing our distinctiveness enough and, and embracing our distinct offering? In my experience, yes. And more so than other places uh, I, I may have experienced. Um, I, I've, uh, on one occasion I've worked in a city that's quite well known for its culture and its art and uh, people around the world say, oh, gosh, we want to be like that. And I sat in a meeting of, a few months ago that was a blow, I blew that one. Um, I, I sat in a meeting whenever that was, and, and somebody said, we need, to be, we need to find what's our equivalent of Dark Mofo. And you go, well, Dark Mofo is their equivalent of what we are. I mean, we, actually, let's not have a loop. Let's not, let's not be competitive, and let's not be competitive with ourselves. Let's be the best us we can be. Actually, I don't know that this, uh, this art gallery would be the same anywhere else in the world, but anything less than this would not have been here. It would not have worked. And that's the point. So I think being really, really honest about your, your state, your place, your beliefs, your history, your future, um, there is no point in pretending uh, that, that this uh, part of land isn't dominated and uh, a conversation between uh, uh, tens of thousands of years of civilization and culture, continuous culture and fabulous storytelling, and a hundred years of, uh, of post-industrial uh, involvement and intervention which has changed everything. That's the conversation. And anything that doesn't acknowledge that uh, means we'd be trying to be Nevada. But how do we prepare to be ready for when the artists whoever that is, whether from here or somewhere else, says, I've got an idea. How do you make sure they go, you know, the people to ring are Western Australia, because they've got ambition, they've got vision, they will do it, they are the ones to be the partner of choice. But denying that there's a strong wind in uh, Perth, for example, uh, and then putting on an event which realize there not to be a strong wind in Perth would be a terrible mistake. One that I made only once, um, and other people made, it's, it happens, but, um, be honest, I think. It's a question up the back from the great Linda Dorrington. This will be a corker, no doubt. We're sending a microphone to you, Linda. For me, the best part is, sorry, thank you. For me, the best part is the collaboration between people from elsewhere and the, and the richness that you have 
in a place. And I think sometimes we get a little frightened of allowing others to come in because it should be from here. But when you collaborate, you're richer for the experience and it takes us elsewhere because mm. when that creative goes away, they take, they build on our reputation as well. So maybe just a little conversation about how we embrace ideas from elsewhere without diminishing what is already here. That's a superb question. And so two, two points to, uh, to, to an answer. First of all, I think there is a role for um, what in education terms is called the creative agent, which is not an artist. It's someone whose job it is to be the broker between a community and the peoples and the artists and everybody else who knows what's out there, knows what's possible, and can hold that conversation so that it happens in the most beautiful way. So that, that role of it's the producer or creative producer, but an agent whose job it is to say, the thing that would totally transform everything here would be this person. But then managing that expectation. And with the collaboration between the Nungar Nation and the French company was incredibly tense at times and difficult. Um, and I think some people came out very bruised, but Actually, the result was that 400,000 people stood um, on the Saturday evening and watched a welcome to country and smoking ceremony uh, and dance. On, it was seven years to the day since Kevin Rudd had said sorry, and uh, the elders and the Jiddy Jiddies and the younger uh, and all the generations of the Nunga nation came together in front of 400,000 people who went crazy with seeing something they many of them had not seen. And afterwards, the elders said that it was one of the most important things they'd experienced. So the benefit is clear, but the journey is, is really sensitive. And then the other example is, is uh, the Lynette Walworth. I touched on it, but the Lynette Walworth uh, project, Collisions, uh, which was about the, uh, the Western Desert, uh, or Southern Desert, and uh, the Maralinga nuclear tests, which Lynette made with, in consultation with the First Peoples, with a whole group of incredible um, Aboriginal filmmakers, artists, and people, who, and obviously Nyeri Nyeri, who had been there. And she made that and showed it at festivals, and then she took it to Davos, where three people a day saw it, until I think the fifth day, when a woman came and saw it, and at the end said, that's amazing, I'm the chair of the World Committee for Nuclear Proliferation and Nuclear Authorization. Do you mind if I bring the rest of the committee to see this? And that's when you say, this story that is about, not this land, but about the broader version of this land, um, gets out into the real world, and that's when the world gets changed. And the world can be transformed by this work because it's putting back in, it's constantly reinvesting into the, the ideas, the skill bank. And of course, the skills of that film are now here, back in the Pilbara, back in the Southern Desert, back in Western Australia, back in uh, Eastern Australia. It's, it's incredible. Are there any other questions from the audience this morning? Oh, and one of, uh, sorry, I, I've got a question, not have no, but um, one of the thoughts is seeking the permission to speak and to asking questions is really important because in, in my experience, most misunderstandings, most uh, bigotry, most uh, fear, hatred, loathing, worry comes from silence and from thinking, I won't ask that question because I'd hate to insult the person I'm in front of. And it happens uh, within um, diverse cultures, it happens within sexuality, it happens within gender, it happens within the disabled community. What if I say the wrong word? What if I ask a question but say blind when I should say sight impaired? What if I, you know, so many things. The answer is if you're speaking with truth and beauty and you're speaking with honesty and respect, 95% of people, if not 99% of people, will respond in the same way and say, actually, that's not a word we use, or you shouldn't do that. And I think that, but I think most things don't happen because people are afraid of saying the wrong thing. And this morning, just saying, I, I, what, finding out what, what would be the word for welcome, and then is it appropriate for me to use it? Uh, because it might not be, and that's fair enough. So asking the question and then listening to the answer is really important. If there are no further questions, we might take a little bit of a break. But before we do take that break, can we have a big round of applause for the wonderful Jonathan Holloway? Thank you.